Hi folks, so in this video we're going to talk about sandboxing and virtualization, specifically around isolation based approaches where basically we have software that we might not trust uh, or that we want to um, restrict to you know, limit the damage that can happen when something goes wrong uh, and we just kind of like isolate that program to only be allowed to access certain resources. So there's a number of related um, technologies and concepts that we're going to talk about and in a separate topic uh, I'll talk about some of the rule-based approaches that you can take, um, like manager access controls based on rules that allow programs to access specific resources. But So this is kind of like the first part of that. So you'll recall, um, and probably fully aware by now, that there are um, some of the um, worst things in that ever happened to cybersecurity, essentially, is the fact that we, the, the decision that was made, I guess, at some point in the past to let software act on our behalf um, and without really thinking that through to what the consequences of that are. And so we've got these two huge areas in cybersecurity, which is vulnerable software. So when the author creates some software, thinking that, you know, with the best intentions, but an attacker is able to make it do something else, uh, either by exploiting a security vulnerability or misconfiguration on that system to basically make it behave in a way that you didn't expect, uh, so that the software is acting on behalf of the attacker instead of the user, or malware, where um, it's actually a related problem it's that we've got software on our system that we don't trust, um, but in this case, the software is actually written to be malicious in the first place. So the person's written some software, they want to do something that you don't want it to do, but either way, you've got the, the, this malicious code has ended up running on your computer. And so whether it's through vulnerable software or malware, we end up with software on our computer that's doing stuff that we don't expect. So the actual security systems that are in place on most computers w were designed to protect users from each other. So the you know, original kind of security model of these computers was that you had multiple users that are sharing one precious resource, which is a computer. So, you know, we had a mainframe server, for example, and everyone were sitting at dumb terminals, basically sharing that same computer and the, the computing power of that computer between the different users that were all logged in at the same time. Um, and we use access controls to try and prevent the kind of damage that can happen on a shared system with users that are running at different privilege levels. So we have access controls that kind of control who's allowed to do what on that system. So we've got subjects, so that's like the users on the system, and we've got objects, which are the resources, such as the files on that system. But because the applications are running with the identity of the user, um, we're making those the assumption that it's acting on the behalf of the user, which is kind of why it all falls apart when you've got malware or vulnerable software in place, because now the attackers can actually take control of some software that's running with someone else's identity. Uh, the, the attacker might not even have a user account on that computer, and they manage to basically get it to run with the user's account. Um, or maybe the attacker is another user on that same system and manage to get some code running as, as a different user, for example. But we end up with this user account um, on the system that's doing something malicious because the application is doing something malicious. So there are a number of solutions that have been proposed that improve the situation so that we kind of limit the amount of damage that a program can do if it tries to do something that you don't expect it to do. And so one way to do that is to run an application in a, in a sandbox, so in like this envi a special environment, so that the program's running in this its own little space and it only gets to access these things within the sandbox and it can't access anything else. Or, you know, we kind of like that you know and there might be some resources that are inside the sandbox and things that are outside of it are out of bounds. We might completely isolate it um, or we might give it some limited access. 
and you know in a, in in a separate video I'll talk about restriction based um, sandboxes and also um, restriction based uh, mandatory access controls um, which kind of are based on uh, like rules about what the programs are allowed to do but one approach is to really isolate things from each other and so we can use an isolated sandbox environment um, so the term sandbox and um, like some kinds of access controls are not always clearly defined the difference between them but essentially you can think of a sandbox as an environment that you get launched into so you can launch a program into a sandboxed environment and then that program just gets to access the things that are in its sandbox that are accessible from within the sandbox. So a related um, technology and technique is basically where you have entire operating systems running in sandboxes. So you can have uh, use virtualization, <coughs> which allows us to basically multiplex the hardware so that we have multiple instances of operating systems um, sharing the same piece of hardware. Um, when I was in um, an undergraduate at university, I remember having a conversation with a professor, uh, basically asking the question, why couldn't we um, like have instances of operating systems sharing um, on, a, on a single computer? And he was like, oh, that's impossible. Just imagine if the, they were all trying to access the floppy disk drive at the same time kind of thing. Right? So it's interesting to see how much things have has changed and moved on, because now we rely on um, virtualization incredibly, the whole internet infrastructure, so much of it runs in vir virtual machines. Uh, we've got our cluster of um, servers hosting VMs for our lab infrastructure. Uh, but you know, the whole way that a lot, you know, probably the majority of the internet is now hosted within virtual machines. So whereas what used to be the case is that every computer had a, an operating system it was just its own computer, <clears throat> and you you know you would just have the processes running on in the operating system, and now you have operating systems within operating systems, um, and uh, which is you can see the um, on the slide there, you can have an operating system that's like a host operating system, um, like a Linux um, for its server for example, and then you'd have a number of offer uh, like you'd have a hypervisor which. Um, also known as the virtual machine monitor, but it basically um, will run um, within the hypervisor or run VMs. And uh, so that's what you would normally see now. It is also, there are other architectures where you can have a hypervisor that is kind of like a bare, bare minimum um, like operating system itself, I guess, but all it does is run VMs uh, is its main job. So on the hardware and it um, runs the you know the, the the VMs on on that. So <clears throat> there's also a distinction there when you are if you are one of those VMs that are that's running, whether you need to know about the fact that you're a VM. So especially in early days, um, the uh, most of the offering systems didn't support being run as a uh, as a guest particularly. Uh, and so it was the, the virtualization was designed in a way where you could just, the, the, the guest operating system doesn't even need to know that it's being virtualized or that, or that the disk it's accessing is not a real disk. So, you know, VMware and VirtualBox all kind of started that way. And then you've got para-virtualization, which is where it uses software emulation um, as part of that. And the guest knows that it's being virtualized and it can use APIs that's provided by the virtualization, which can be an efficiency rather than pretending like it's acting, accessing a real disk. So if it knows it's in a, that it is a, a VM, then it can treat things a little bit differently and it doesn't have to pretend it's writing to a, like a, a real disk, for example. It can take some shortcuts. And so, um, you know there are um, the there are things like Zen and user mode Linux that are like a system level runs a whole operating system, but it doesn't have to do all the work. Um, so the kernel can take some shortcuts, and 
offload some of the work to the actual kernel that's running in the host operating system. And so, and since then, VMware and VirtualBox have introduced those um, power virtualization as well, uh, although it's, uh, it's, it's optional. So there are other um, systems, which includes Cubes, um, and Cubes is a, quite an interesting research project, and you can download it and install it. Um, it doesn't really like being installed in a VM, ironically. It wants to be installed on it, unless they've, you know, since I've last looked at it anyway. It wants to be installed on a, an actual PC. But what Cubes does, <clears throat> it's, it's a really interesting distribution of Linux, really, where it runs all of the um, applications inside VMs, and it... Um, has different kinds of VMs for different types of tasks that you might want to perform. So if you're running games, they'll all run into one of your VMs. But if you do your internet banking, that'll run into another VM. And obviously, that simplifies. Um, well, it's more complicated than if you weren't doing that, but it's much simpler than if you were trying to manually have all separate VMs to try and protect yourself against something going wrong. Uh, so it kind of builds that into the operating system itself. <coughs> so you know, it's quite interesting. Uh, so it has separation and isolation, uh, high availability, dis disaster recovery, uh, multiple operating systems, and the rest of it. So, you know, the, it's quite interesting. It's an interesting project. So uh, I guess the question is, can you use hardware emulation VMs to confine individual applications? So if you have a piece of software that you don't trust, uh, say, for example, um, like a, pro, a, a software company has had lots of security problems in the past, not pointing any fingers, but someone like Adobe, for example, if you're going to run some of their software on your computer, you might, um, you know, be it uncertain, um, you might think, well, are there going to be more security problems that they don't know about yet? Uh, and so um, you run that in a VM. Um, certainly you could do that. Um, you know, I have a... I'm sure I've done that in the past. You, okay, you're not sure. Just run that software in, a, in its own VM. Um, that's fine. Except now you've got another virtual machine that needs to be managed. So that means that all the software updates need to get on that operating system that you just put that one program into. You now need to keep that system up to date. In you know, And then if you imagine that every program that you used, if you were going to put them into separate like operating systems and for every application, then the, the actual management task becomes ridiculous. Which is why something like Cubes, if you were going to take that approach anyway, uh, kind of can help help you. Container-based solutions, so a container-based sandbox shares the kernel, but each container has separate user space resources. So what that means is that you normally an operating system obviously involves the, the kernel, which is probably the most important piece of software that you have on your computer. Uh, and it is talking uh, between, it's the, the, middle, the middle man between the, um, the applications on your computer and the hardware on your computer. So, you know, it's managing all of your resources and things. As you know, the kernel is doing all that important stuff. So each time you have a full operating system, then you've got another copy of the kernel that's doing all that work again. And so you actually kind of end up doing twice as much work because every time you access a file, that kernel does all of the normal kernel-y things that happen when you access a file, include, including like using drivers to do the interaction with the hardware. It's looking at the access control permissions and making a decision about that and the rest of it. And the way that containerization works is instead of having a full, or uh, like all of that, Again, it has another, um, basically it uses the one kernel, but it kind of sections off um, what the programs can access to just what's within this container. And it means that you can have, if you want to, you can have a full operating system, like the rest of the operating system, like a distribution of Linux, for example, uh, with all the packages that you want. So you can have completely different distributions of Linux as well, as long as they're compatible, because they'll be sharing the one kernel. Uh, so you can have a single kernel image, uh, and it is basically being used by these different operating systems that are running in different containers. So it's much more efficient, really. It saves um, processing power. Um, 
and there, um, there's a number of different solutions like chroot, jails, and Linux conta containers. I'm going to say a little bit about those. So chroot is a system call on Unix systems, so it's been around for a long time, and it changes the root directory for a process and its children. So if you call chroot, then what happens is it, um, you can say, so you've got your whole directory structure of files on your computer, and within that, you've got a directory that has a bunch of files in it. Um, you can say, well, chroot into that directory. And then when you look at what's on, then from all the programs that are in that chroot, when they look at what's on the disk, they just see the stuff that's underneath that from that point down. So they can't get at any of the rest of the file system. They just see that area of the file system. And um, there's a wrapper program called chroot that calls the chroot. Um, system call, but you can use that to kind of launch programs into this ch root jail or into this like container. So kind of cool, it's super simple. You can basically use it so that programs can't uh, easily access other files on the system. They just get to see its own kind of section. And you can put a full distribution of Linux into a ch root potentially. Um, only root can perform ch root. Um, but if root do, when root does perform a chroot, it should change identity as soon as possible because root can escape a chroot jail, um, basically by just calling chroot again. Um, so there's no pro, no program in a chroot should ever stay as root. There's also um, so sh um, there are resources such as process controls and networking that are not mediated. So if any program inside a chroot could send a signal to any other program. You can see all the other processes running on your computer. You can access the networking with no limitations. Um, so actually, it's almost not really a security mechanism. It's just kind of like a feature of the operating system that has some security like um, behaviors. And so it's almost there. It's got some interesting stuff, but we can build on that to build some actual interesting security features. So um, we can use other mechanisms like um, free BSD jails, which basically builds in extra restrictions around networking and process access and things like that, so that you can actually use it to restrict processes. So there's also Linux kernel C groups, which can limit the resources like CPU, um, resources that can be used, so you can't consume all the resources, memory resources, um, block IO, network resources, and things like that. So it also solves some of those kinds of problems. Um, and so when you combine that with chroot, you've got an interesting thing again. So Linux containers, um, which is um, a, uh, abbreviated as LXC for whatever reason, I guess Linux containers, uh, builds on chroot and it uses um, C groups so that then you get that isolation. So now you can put, um, you can have operating system virtualization in a container, um, and you know it has some extra protection against root users from escaping confinement. Um, and if you're sloppy about how you set up containers, you can also people that aren't root could escape as well um, or access resources outside it. So you need to be careful. Um, but yeah, Linux containers is the um, <clears throat> it. it Use a chroot to actually provide like a sandbox that you can run a uh, an operating system within while sharing the kernel. Docker is the most popular container solution. I'm not sure how they did it. They've got just amazing PR, I guess, and some good um, tools and things. But basically, it takes um, it builds on virtualization features like uh, um, Linux containers and other things like libcontainer, which is a, a library. Um, to automate the creation and deployment of containerized operating systems and applications. So do Docker is, is really cool, actually. Right? So you can um, basically spin up a Docker container, and there's a whole, um, the, there's a whole bunch of shared um, images and things that are online. Um, you can go to hub.docker.com, and from there you can um, download well, you can just see how you can download different uh, Docker images and things. And with Docker, you can just quickly download a full operating system, and and um, you know you can do provisioning to put 
software into it and things like that. So, you know, it's pretty cool. It's portable across Linux systems. Um, there is, uh, I think, I think from memory, Docker can be hosted on Windows, but you can't put Windows inside Docker. Um, there's uh, has versioning and there are reusable base images, so you can have a a base image of, for example, uh, an Ubuntu base image or Debian, and then on top of that, you can put other things. Um, so you could then, you know, you can, um, yeah, pull down your base image and, and do things with it. Um, so another kind of sandbox is copy and write sandboxes. So a copy and write sandbox is um, where you have, um, so if you've got some software that you don't quite trust, you can basically launch it inside the sandbox and um, you know in some cases it can still see all the things on your computer and it might just think it's running as a normal process on your offering system but whenever it tries to write to the disk it just the changes that it makes get saved separately so that from outside the sandbox nothing's changed from inside the sandbox it thinks it's making changes to your system and um, it basically can't might not be able to tell the difference or um, the often software can figure out that it's running in a VM but the point is that you can limit the damage that the software can do in terms of writing to your computer if you're um, worried about the software reading all of your secret files off your computer and uploading them all onto the internet, then a copy on the copy on write sandbox uh, might not really help you because they they often aren't configured to stop the access; um, they just stop the writing. But you know there there are also options on some of these systems to to also limit access as well. But for the most part, it's about well, obviously as the the name says the feature of a copy, copy and write sandbox is that it, it makes a copy when you're writing to a file and, and it changes the copy instead. Um, so if you are using a Windows system I um, recommend using Sandboxy uh, if you just want to install some software that you're not sure about for example because it, it's copy and write sandbox it's super easy to use you just run your software and then at the end you can see exactly what changes that software you did to your system, so what files it changed, what registry changes it made, and things like that. And so, you know, you could basically that can help you to figure out whether the software is malicious or not. And if you are happy with all the changes it made, then you might just start using the software outside the sandbox, for example. Um, you know, and so that's if you're just a little bit unsure about the program uh, and you don't want to go to the effort of like putting inside an entire offering system instance, for example, or spinning up a Docker container, which is, to be fair, not that hard to do. Um, so Sandboxy, Pastures, and Alcatraz are examples of, of copy and write sandboxes. Self-contained applications is a, I guess, closely related idea where you have software that's running inside a sandbox. Um, and that is an approach where you force each application to be completely self-contained with no ambient authority to other resources. So um, ambient authority is, authority is the, um, which I've talked about in the past in a different, um, in a different lecture um, and different topic entirely actually. Um, but ambient authority is the problem where you have software, it's all related exactly to this, what we're talking about now actually. Ambient authority is where you've got a program and just while it's running, it holds the ability to do a whole bunch of stuff that it might not even need to do or care about. But because that program's running, for example, with your user identity, then it has a whole bunch of ambient authority to be able, be able to do everything that you can do on the system, essentially. Um, so, but with self-contained applications, we might require user intervention. So sometimes it's called a power box, um, but basically you have, like, when you are using um, something like um, let's flash for example and it wants to access a file when you browse to that file and click yes open this file that's basically giving the program that's running the ability to access it um, so it can't access arbitrary programs it can't just read all the files off your disk it has to prompt you 
and then once you choose that file, then it can access it, which is also the way that a lot of web browsers um, work in order to allow a um, like website to access the files on your computer. The same kind of thing, uh, like a JavaScript that's running inside your web browser can't just access all of your files on your computer, but it can prompt to open a file, and when you open it, or um, then it can access that file. Um, so Java applets is very old, very old fashioned. Thankfully, um, was the way that back in um, back in the early days of the web, um, when you wanted to have an interactive website, you would have like a whole Java program basically that would load up and um, would run uh, inside your web browser. Um, so there was Java applets. Um, better than ActiveX, which was the other thing at the time, um, which is basically where it just runs a program natively on your computer uh, with like no restrictions. Basically, you just had to trust that the, the website you were visiting to, yeah, you can control my computer, no worries. Um, thankfully, that's not the case anymore, but that's literally how, um, you know, what used to work. Um, if you had a website that wanted to be interactive enough, you'd go there and it would prompt you. Um, so Silverlight, which uh, was Microsoft's answer to Flash, and thankfully we've moved on from Silverlight and Flash nowadays. We've got HTML5, and we're all moving to interactive websites and things. Um, Google Native Code, which is a way that you can have a website that has uh, like assembly code uh, that runs inside your web browser, basically, not uh, or something similar to assembly. Um, so yeah, so I went off off topic there a few times, but I think there were interesting anecdotes. Um, so some of the pros and cons for isolation uh, based confinement uh, and sandboxing is that it's good for shared servers where you have basically completely isolated systems make sense when you have like a multi-tenant um, hardware. So if, I'm, if I've got my website and I'm hosting it on a computer and you've got your website and we're hosting it on the same computer, I don't mind that we're completely isolated from each other and that you can't access any of my things and I, you, you can't access any of mine. That's, that's perfect. Um, so it's good for those sorts of things. Um, what it's not good for is um, there's of, of often redundancy in resources. So if we have complete copies of operating systems for everything, so if we um, were just trying to install all of the, all the programs that we use on our computer in the separate operating systems, and um, then we start up installing libraries, different libraries into each each operating system, and or the same multiple copies or the same copy of the same software into all these different systems and then every time we want to update the operating system we need to update it across all these different VMs um, and so you know there are issues there um, around just the amount of management work that's involved um, there are ways that you can reduce the redundancy so you can use hard links for example but then you need to be very careful about um, you know how the the, these shared resources are protected, uh, but you could you can try and set that up in a way where you reduce the redundancy. You can have in virtualization. There's often often um, options for um, to save deltas between VMs and things. And so there are clever things we can do, but these are just some of the challenges. Is that we kind of just inherently have redundancy problems, um, and. You know, obviously, we want to do this to restrict what information can flow between these systems. But then, as a normal user, we will want information to flow through these different systems. If I've got a um, video editing application and I cut together a video and then I want to upload it to YouTube, for example, then I'll need to get that video over into a different virtual machine, I guess, and then you know, and to into the VM that has my web browser in it and whatever. Uh, or then what often happens is actually we have these kind of poke holes in the isolation. So we'll set up shared um, folders and things. And then that becomes a um, potential point of, well, now we need to be really careful about um, these kind of breakpoints or these places where we're lowering down the, the shield. Um, and now, you know, if you were just Ah, it's fine, it's in a VM, I can just install malware, it won't matter, it's protected. 
but then if you've got a shared folder with that VM that's also sharing with an important something else, then obviously we need to be careful. So there's workflow and usability issues there. So <clears throat> that's the end on, on this topic. I hope you found that interesting. It's, it's an area where um, there's still a way to go <clears throat> and there's still spaces to improve, but there's all, all sorts of really interesting stuff's happened uh, in the last decade. Um, things like containers have really taken off and they're used uh, like to a massive extent. Um, obviously, we, in our infrastructure, we tend to use full operating systems, uh, so full virtualization, um, <clears throat> because we want you to experience, you know, we want to be able to have our students experience like using Linux and Windows systems and things like complete operating systems and, and how systems interact with each other with like normal networking and things. Um, but, you know, if we were just going for hosting a bunch of stuff, <clears throat> Um, as efficiently as possible, we might use containers more often. I mean, obviously we do use containers so that we can teach containers and things. Um, but, you know, if you are just trying to host a website, as many websites as you can on a, the number of servers you have, then you might choose to use um, containers instead because you get this really good uh, balance of the amount of resources and overhead that you need, especially when you've got things like um, Docker that can help to um, sort of automate some of those things um, and the protection that you get from being isolated. So, thanks.